be present here with us, that you'd send your spirit upon us, that you'd give us wisdom and discernment, Lord, that, that you'd lead and guide this, this time of conversation, that it would be fruitful. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right into discipline, and I'm going to start with somewhat of a broad question for you guys, and, but it's a, a very foundational question as, as we think about disciplining our children. The question is, why would we discipline our children? Why do you guys discipline your children? In obedience to God. Use your mic, use, use your mic please. Um, no. <laughs> In obedience to God. <laughs> that's, what God that's what God tells us to do. So I'm going to read out of Ephesians 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so the reason we're disciplining our children is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord so it'll go well with them. Because we care for them, we love them, we have a burden for them to be following the Lord. And so we're not doing it out of a burden for us, but we're doing it out of a burden for them to know Jesus and to obey him. Yeah, and I would add to that Proverbs thirteen twenty four says, whoever spares the rod hates his son but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So one of the reasons we discipline is because we love our kids. And uh, a failure to discipline is actually defined in the Bible, not our definition, but what the Bible says, is actually hatred towards our kids. So if we truly love our kids, uh, we will be faithful to dis- diligent, it says, to discipline them. Are there any other uh, scriptures that, that you guys have have had influenced the way that you have disciplined or shaped you as, as parents? I think that one of the things that I think about with when it comes to discipline is obviously we want to point our kids to Jesus. We want to point our kids to um, their Heavenly Father and in Hebrews, it's really clear that God disciplines us, that God disciplines those that he loves. And I think that in one sense, it's just helping them see a clear picture of God when we discipline them. It's, you know, it would be unloving for kids to go through their childhood and never experience discipline and then all of a sudden expect to have this this adult life where they never get disciplined when actually, the, you know, the Lord disciplines those he loves, that he disciplines his sons. And that, that can be a really comforting thing. Like, oh, I mean, when I, when I go through hard times, sometimes it's like, oh, I hate this hard time. But it's like, oh, no, you know, trials, hardships, endure them as discipline. And it's like, oh, okay, this is, this is the Lord being kind to me and helping me share in his holiness, and um, just it helps me be grateful for discipline. And so I think that that's something that, you know, with that backdrop, it's, it's easy to help bring up kids with more of a, a value for discipline, es- especially if we as parents value discipline ourselves and the discipline that the Lord brings in our own lives. Yeah, and just to piggyback off that, um, with in Hebrews um, 12, 11, it says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Um, So obviously this is, this is God's way, right? He set this out, um, set this up for us and has um, given us instructions for how we should love our children through discipline. Um, But also um, the discipline is for yielding actual fruit, right? Um, So it's one of God's ways of um, producing fruit in our children. So we want to be obedient to God in that way and trust that when he asks us to do something, that it will work if we obey, if we obey it and follow it. Along with that, I think of uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
Uh, since it's the first commandment with a promise, when it says that if our kids obey us, it's going to go well with them. Uh, I, so because of that verse, I will often think of uh, sin, the context of my children, in the way that pretty much the most destructive thing for my kids is sin. And one of my, my roles in disciplining them uh, is so that they would not sin, that it would go well with them, actually. If they obey me, uh, it's going to go well with them. And if I desire it to go well with them, I need to also desire them to obey me. And in order for them to obey me, I need to discipline them. Um, not to mention that when they learn to obey me, if they're learning to obey me as God's delegated authority, they're also indirectly learning to obey God, which also carries with it blessings. So I, I, I sometimes look at it as obedience to me and my wife with our kids is kind of this umbrella of, of promise, that if I can discipline them, it keeps them underneath that umbrella and promise. It keeps them staying within that place where it's going to go well with them. And I want it to go well with my kids. Uh, the verse right before what Josh was sharing is in verse 10, Hebrews 12 verse 10 says, God the Father disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. And so there's a, there's a desire for me to see my kids share in God's holiness because I know when, the, when they are abstaining from sin, when they are obeying their parents, and when they are sharing in God's holiness, it's going to go best for them. And I ultimately desire uh, it to go well for my kids. Okay, so how do we discipline our kids in a way that actually points them towards following Jesus? So that, that, to me, goes along with Ephesians 6, 4, when you're bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, it's both. You know, when they're younger, it, it's more on the spanking instruction as they get older and they outgrow that time period. It's, it's more on, heavy on the instruction side, and sometimes there are consequences and discipline that look different than spanking when the kids are older as well with the instruction. But it's important to do instruction all along the way, even, even when they're two years old, to make sure you're teaching them at the age appropriateness of this is why we're disciplining you. We're disciplining you because we desire for you to obey mom and dad and obey God. And, and point them to Jesus. Do it out of a heart that's loving. Pray with them afterwards. Give them a hug. Let them know you're forgiven. I'm not mad at you. I'm not doing this because I'm mad at you. I'm doing this because I love you. And as we point them to Jesus, this is why we're doing this because we desire for you to obey him. It's going to shepherd their hearts towards him. And that's why we do this, is to not make our lives easier, but to shepherd their hearts, to point them to their Heavenly Father, and our desires for them to obey Him. Yeah, I uh, totally agree with that. And um, I think one of the practical uh, pitfalls that prevents us from pointing towards Jesus when we're disciplining is making it an issue between um, us and our children, which... Um, you know, when you look at it on the surface, it's, it, it's one of those things that it just kind of sneaks up on you. I think especially when you're dealing with uh, an issue that over and over and over again with a kid that just does not seem to be getting it. Um, you know, some of the little one-off things here and there I think are simpler to keep that approach, but I know my wife and I um, tend towards frustration and feeling offended ourselves, especially when it's something where we're like, man, we've talked about this so much. And then you can subtly shift away from the desire to point them towards Christ through the discipline and for it to be between them and God. Ultimately, through obedience, right? The mechanism is through obedience to mom and dad. But um, I think that's one of the, when that goes, and then the gospel starts to slip away as well from the discipline. And then it starts to become about something else instead of pointing them to Christ. Mm -hmm. I hope you guys can pick up on how foundational everything that, that's being said right now is. This, is. this is laying a foundation for why, for how, for, for everything that you're going to do as a parent. These things are so important. Yeah, I think, I mean, I really agree with you, Josh. It's like that when uh, the first time that concept got taught to me I was just like oh that's a game changer because when it's about you and your kid well I mean obviously you're asking the question why do we discipline 
And so often we can say, like, oh, it's because, uh, you know, we're Christians or because the Bible says so. But really when you start having kids and you actually start realizing that they don't do everything that you want and they don't make you happy every day of your life, you're like, oh, this is hard for me. Or, like, I'm offended, or, you know, especially as they get older, I'm offended. Like, I've, I'm doing this because I love them. I want it to go well for them. And you can easily lose track, like you were saying. It's a pitfall, like, where it's, oh, this be it can easily become an uh, issue between ourselves and our kids, right? Where it actually it's their, their real issue, um, if it's disobedience, if it's a sin issue, it's with God. And um, it's hard to keep that, that focal point. Um, but I, I mean, I think godly parenting can't be done without that vision, right? That, um, that goal is really... I want my kid to relate rightly to God. I want my kid to see God rightly. And when that, when that vision gets lost, then I think discipline actually gets really screwed up. And then I, like, I understand why people have a problem with spanking, too. You know, because obviously we believe that the Bible says that spanking is right. But um, if spanking is done because there's an issue with you and your kid, then, yeah, that actually can be abuse, you know. I think one of the main sources of um, my frustration personally in disciplining is is selfishness. And if we think about, like, why am I frustrated with my kid right now? It's because they're pulling me away from what I want to be doing, sometimes what I should be doing. Um, And those could be good things. But if we take a step back and we think, okay, no, I'm disciplining um, not for my own, not for my sake only, not for my kids' sake only, but for Christ's sake. Mm-hmm. And if we bring the gospel back into the picture, it's a lot easier um, to discipline in love and not in frustration. So I think when we get frustrated, it's a good moment just to check ourselves and be like, "Why am I frustrated right now? I'm frustrated because I'd really rather my kid be quiet right now." And obvi- I mean, obviously that's really nice, but it's not. It doesn't happen all the time, so it's good just to check ourselves and um, go back to the basics of, like, no, I'm doing this for Christ's sake, and um, I need to die to myself right now and uh, do this in love, not frustration. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I really agree with what Monique said, and it takes faith. That's one thing that really the Lord has shown me in disciplining your kids in the instruction of the Lord. It, It takes faith to do that, to be obedient to that, to trust God's ways, to trust that his word is true. And I've heard parents before, and I've said this myself, actually, I can remember, where it's not working. When, when our kids were younger, it's not working. And when I look back and I see the fruit of consistency and believing that God's ways were, were going to be true, I, I see the fruit of that, that over time it worked, that his, his ways were true. And I think every parent... Um, probably goes through some period of time in there when their kids are younger, they're saying, I, I don't think this is working. Um, and I would just encourage you to just have faith that God's word is true, that his ways are true. If you continue to be consistent, continue to have a, a heart that's obedient to the Lord, to his ways, not, not of a, a burden for your, um, your, what you want, your kids to obey you for your convenience, but have a burden for them to be obeying Jesus, um, it, will, it will produce fruit of righteousness. So us disciplining our children is, is actually us pointing our children to God's authority, right? Us having them submit to our authority um, is kind of almost like just that, that middle stepping ground to, to them seeing, seeing God's authority properly. So let's, let's get into more of the nitty gritty. When should I start disciplining my child? Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I want to give an age here. Um, for us, uh, we started very young, like a couple months old, um, when we really started. Obviously, when they're, when they're really small, um, you're trying to figure out what's defiance and what's like discomfort or um, it's, it's a little challenging sometimes. And I think because of just how fragile babies are and how incredibly cute they are, 
Um, sometimes it can be natural just be like, well, I don't want to like inflict any pain upon them. Like, uh, let's just play it safe. And maybe there is a little defiance there, but we can't tell for sure. So let's just, rather than disciplining, um, let's just wait. And I think that's, that's a trap that's easy to fall in. I know I've felt that um, way. But the way that Monique and I have viewed it is that with little kids, um, defiance will kind of sneak in to their normal routine, okay? Things that normal infants and babies do. And we just need to be sort of understanding of that because we know that folly is bound up in our kids. Mm -hmm. And we just need to go in it with the approach that, like the way my wife and I do is, um, we don't want to allow any defiance of authority whether that's like throwing food on the floor or not eating when we're asking our, our child to eat. Um, we don't want that to sneak in and make excuses for it and just call it, oh, it's just you know baby stuff. Maybe they're uncomfortable, they're not hungry anymore, whatever it is, and then allow months and months and months of uh, defiance of authority be in the heart of our kid because we believe that will, pr that will produce bad fruit that we then later on when they're older will have to deal with, and it's a lot more deep-rooted. It's not just a quick little, you know, uh, testing of boundaries. It's like an established defiance of authority that has existed in secret for a long time because um, it wasn't as clear, maybe, when they're smaller. But I think that what we've found is that when you start um, just assuming it's there, like assuming that your kid wants to be defiant and really looking for it, and wanting to be loving and take care of that so that it does go well with them, like, like you were saying earlier, um, I think it starts to actually become more clear. It goes from being a little fuzzy to you being able to discern the difference between when something's you know, not really defiance and when something is. Um, I don't think it's 100%, but we personally have taken the approach. We start when... Um, the disciplining when uh, our kids are really young, a couple months old. One thing that is good to remember is that our children at birth, have, as it says in Romans 5, have a sinful nature. So that they're born with a sinful heart. They're, they're born in their hearts actually opposed to God. And it's not until they're born again that they're given a new heart. And so it, it actually starts at birth, <clears throat> disobedience. Their heart are, is actually opposed to the Lord's ways. And so it's, it's good for us to have that vision going in because it's so easy to think, my kids are so good, my kids are so cute, my baby is so cute. Yeah. And I, I've fallen into that with each one of our kids. Yeah. And, but when we realize that they have a sinful heart, that they need a new heart, and that it's actually my responsibility as a husband that I'm accountable to God to shepherd their heart, to instruct them and discipline them, and that I'm, I'm actually going to be accountable to God for my family and how I do that, then, then it's a different alertness that we need to put on. And um, it, it comes pretty early as you're watching. It, it comes in a diaper change where there, you see the rebellious heart where I don't want to do that. I don't want to sit still for a diaper change. And so um, rather than even saying a certain age, it, it's good to know from day one at birth that they, they have a sinful heart, that their, their ways are opposed to God's ways, and, and we're instructed as parents to train them up to the Lord and pray that the Lord would give them a new heart. Um, yeah, one thing that I don't think there's every kid is going to be exactly the same. There's like one age you do it. But I do think as soon as you start to see that you give instruction and they don't like that instruction and they're like disobedient to that, that for sure would be a sign like, okay, they are going against what I am asking them. And I think that's a really good thing to start off with. And like I said, I think some kids show that really early and you ask them to do something or even you, as much as even going to sleep. I know that sounds weird, but like they're not doing that and you are training them. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna wait until they understand this. I think that's a trap a lot of people get into. Like, oh, I'll wait. They don't quite understand. No, you are the one, because they don't understand, you're the one to help them understand. I think sometimes it's, it's like an excuse, like, oh, this, or they're tired, or that, but actually you're responsible to train them, not to let them just do it on their own. So I think 
like, okay, I noticed they're doing this, we'll then instruct them. And it's, there's a lot of Bible verses, I think, about instructing, being diligent. So that means, like, constantly instructing. And so it's, it's going to be a lot of it from little on. Um, as far as the, the thing, well, they, they don't understand. I have to wait till they understand. Um, two things on that. One, one of the best ways that kids understand who can't understand English is through discipline. So they can understand just not through the English language or whatever language you speak. They can understand through the language of discipline. And they will learn that, oh, if I roll over or stick my hand in my own poo when I'm being changed, that I'm going to get a little spanking for that, they will understand, even though that they don't, in their brains, understand English. They will understand discipline. And it's, the second thing is, I think that's really important, too, because if we, if we tell our kids that we're only going to discipline them when they understand, we're teaching them something false about God. God doesn't only discipline us when we understand, or he doesn't only require obedience when we understand. Oftentimes, God requires us to obey him even when we don't understand. And it's important for us to teach our kids that you have to obey God whether you understand or not, uh, because you're going to have to do it later on as an adult when you're following him. Did you have something? Um, just kind of a testimony of seeing the Lord's promise in our kids' lives. And I'm going to bring this back around. It might sound like not on topic, but um, two of our kids are adopted, and we adopted them when they were older. And when they came to live with us, they'd never been disciplined before, never been spanked in a right way. And when they came to live with us, we weren't really sure, like, should we be doing this? We believe in this, but is this something that we should be doing with their past history? And it was came on pretty soon where um, Josh felt like the Lord um, wanted us to. And it was almost um, instant for our son in his understanding of feeling loved um, because, like, the purpose of a part of, you know, being a father, he disciplines because he loves us. And I think Josh quoted that verse earlier. Um, a part of our kids' understanding that the father loves him, them and that we love them is them being disciplined. So why not start um, helping them understand the father's love at a young age? Yeah. So, I mean, not to say, like, it, it was really important for our sons, even though, like, the opportunity didn't come until they were a little bit older, but it still produced a lot of fruit of them understanding how to be loved and not an orphan. Yeah. Which, which honestly was super sweet to watch. I mean, when um, the guys first came, the boys came to, to live with you guys and just like knowing the, the things that they had gone through, the childhood that they had, and honestly just somewhat how out of control that they were when they first came, you know, just because of the, the lack of parenting, the lack of love, even the, some of the abuse that they had. And then watching you guys just lovingly come into just parenting them and doing things God's ways and even the process of like really being patient and gracious, knowing that they were transitioning, but starting to discipline them in, in a biblical way and then watching them change was just so sweet like I mean it was sweet because we got to watch that you know and obviously be a part of your lives as that was happening but um just even watching the boys like really accept love like know what love was and accept love and just like I mean they're still kids you know no one likes getting the spanking but like feeling like growing security and confidence as they were being lovingly parented yeah. and and disciplined was Honestly, it was like, it was so cool to watch the transformation in them. Yeah. And um, just, again, I agree, just a testimony of God's ways, his goodness, his faithfulness, and yeah, super sweet. In the church in general, um, there's been a swing away from disciplining through, through uh, spanking, and there's, it's been more maybe instruction or reasoning can can you guys speak into that a little bit? What what's the balance between instruction and and discipline or, or reasoning with your children and discipline? 
Um, Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And uh, I think we do our kids a disservice when we give them choices before they have wisdom. And the world, that's the way of the world right now. The world says give them choices as young as possible. Uh, just heavy on instruction, low on discipline. Let them choose from a young age when they're fools. Why are we letting fools make decisions? It's, the Bible says that folly is bound up in the heart of a child, and discipline tri- drives it far from them. And so uh, in Ted Tripp's book, uh, Shepherding the Heart of a Child, chapter 4 of that book is worth its weight in gold, if you ever want to read a really good chapter on this topic. But he talks about how when kids are young, you're heavy on the discipline side and way less on instruction, although there's still instruction involved. And then as they get older... You're less, di- I mean, I, I wasn't spanking my 200-pound kid this last year, you know, uh, who could easily take me. <laughs> um, there's a reason for that. I'm try- I was trying to teach him discipline at a young age so that he would respect my instruction now. Now, uh, there's, there's the, the balance of that is I think you go heavy on that when they're younger to teach them the fear of the Lord, to teach them authority. If a kid doesn't understand authority, then why would he care when you say the Bible says? Why would he care when you say God says? Why would he care when he says you say, when you say you say, because you're God's delegated authority? They first need to be taught authority. And I think that's that's the important emphasis that needs to happen in parenting and is very countercultural. And it's something that the world will never understand because they don't understand where authority comes from. They're just going by human reasoning and worldly thinking. But we understand that the authority that is given to parents is given by God and is delegated by God. And we know where wisdom comes from. It comes from the fear of the Lord. And so us teaching our kids to hate evil, teaching them the fear of the Lord, teaching them to respect God's authority even when they don't understand is going to equip them, hopefully, uh, when they're older, to make wise decisions and then to receive our instruction as coming not just from a parent that they can dismiss because they don't agree, but coming from God himself. Totally agree. Um, God's ways are to trust him with obedience, regardless of our own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Uh, Abraham and Isaac, God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And obviously that takes great faith and obedience to be able to do that. And his ways are not for us to question. His ways are not for us to understand it's because he is God, and we submit to him. And so if we're at an early age trying to reason with our kids, tell them to make good choices, um, ex- over-explain things to them when they're too young to understand it, we're actually teaching them to rebel. We're teaching them to have a little bit of sweet rebellion. You have to understand our ways in order to obey them, and therefore understand God's ways in order to obey him. But really, God's ways are to obey him because he is God. And and I've seen it, and uh, we were talking about this other day. You know, we, we were hanging out with the family a little bit ago, and the, the father was talking to a, a child that was way too young to even understand and was telling this little child to, you know, make good choices, and, you know, that's a good choice. And, and it it's actually shows how this world has come in and, and caused confusion in, in the way that we're supposed to parent and the way that God wants us to parent. Because this child had no context to understand what the father was saying to him. And in many ways, we don't have the context to understand what our Heavenly Father is saying to us other than he's telling us to obey him. And then we see later why his ways, why he was telling us to obey. Just like Abraham saw later why he, God told him to sacrifice Isaac because he had a plan and he wanted to see his obedience. So um, we, have to, we have to trust that God's ways are better and we have to teach our kids that in the same way. Yeah, um, on that, I mean, just getting in conversations with so many people over the years about disciplining and then um, even just being brought up in the home that I was and hearing my parents talk about it, you know, you'll hear things like, you know, when people, parents get into discussions, right, people will be like, oh, how do you, like, how do you, you know, raise your kids? I, I come from a family of nine, right, so my parents got asked that a lot. Like, oh, how do you how do you even do that? Like, how, I mean, I don't know how you handle nine kids. I can't even handle my two. And there's a lot of 
you know, things like that. And then, you know, you try to be sensitive, right, because we know that spanking is not, you know, the most popular thing or there's, understandably so, there's a reaction sometimes when people just talk about spanking because it's been abused and, you know, we want to be careful to, like, bring that up in a right way and make sure that people understand we're talking about something biblical. Just like, you know, people will say things like, well, I don't spank my kids because I love them. But like what you were saying, you know, it's kind of going back to God is God and his way, like whether we understand them or not, they're right. I just, um, I was, I want to read uh, a few verses. Proverbs thirteen twenty four says, whoever spares the rod hates his son but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Then Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child. This was already quoted, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs twenty three thirteen says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. And those verses just sound so, like, harsh. They just sound so... <laughs> Um, strong and out there but it's like you said like is God God yes is are his ways true if we don't like them or don't understand them are they still right and true yes they are and um, on top of that which again that's that's first and foremost it's just over the years of just seeing the fruit of biblical discipline people actually lovingly spanking their kids. I mean, there's all different things that people can use, right? I mean, we've seen it, and maybe we've even done some of it. But there is something to just straight up, like reading those verses, even in Hebrews when it talks about discipline is painful for a moment. Like, there's something to just painful little spanking in a biblical, loving way that just bears fruit. There's, like, there's no question about it, right? Like, it's... over all the, just meeting all the kids that we have over the years, just seeing the fruit in our own homes. Um, God's ways are true because God's God, but there's also, I mean, there is proof of it. It, it. There actually is evidence that God's ways are right. So with, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys answer here in a second, but with, with discipline, we're mainly speaking about spanking so far. What, this, this might be a little bit more of a controversial uh, topic, but but what about timeouts? Like, what are there benefits to timeouts? Uh, are there other methods? You you brought up that there's, you know, there's other methods that can be can be used. Um, yeah, I'll I'll speak to that. Um, so, um, my wife and I also we're gonna give a little background. Some of you probably know this, but we also sort of fostered, it was unofficial fostering of three kids a couple years ago. I don't even remember when it was, but um, it was weird because of, you know, they're not our kids and their mom was in our life and their dad was in our life and it got super messy. Um, At this time, I was unsure of how to handle discipline with these kids and these poor kids, hadn't had very healthy discipline. So you can imagine they needed a good uh, bit of it when they were with us. And actually it was interesting because it was very frustrating for our oldest son to watch us not discipline them for things that he had been disciplined for so many times. And I can't, I mean, I can't even remember and count how many times he came to me and be like, why are you not, like, did you see what they did? You know, I'm just trying to explain to him, like, we can't, you know, they're not our kid. Like, um, but anyway, so we went the timeout route with them. And, I don't want to say that it doesn't work at all, but man, it was incredibly inconvenient, required a massive amount of time, and never at the end of it did I experience the the brokenness and the reciprocating love that I've seen from my kids when I've spanked them, okay? Never had that happen before. Um, not to say that it doesn't work on the short term to, you know, help the situation, um, but I actually, we were doing this whole timeout thing. It got to be where it was like, we couldn't do things as a family because it was like so many like little timeouts and groundings were happening here and there with these little kids that just needed to be spanked that I finally just said, <laughs> I'm just going to spank them. Um, 
And it's insane, the difference that, um, just of, of fruit, the difference in fruit. And even my relationship with these three little kids grew so much faster. It was exponential because of the love they were receiving from me. And, you know, you can look at that and be like, oh, well, that's just because, you know, you parented really well, or you did this and that really well, and I just want to go back to what was said earlier. I think it's just because it's God's ways, and he set it up that way. And the wisdom of the world is creeping in to the church, and we are trying to apply reasoning and think that, like, spanking, for instance, is the, is the world's idea. Like, this is our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, and they were just, like, really hard. You know, they were just hard-nosed, and so let's not do what our parents did. Like, let's go over here and do something else that... I think we have to be humble before, like what you guys were saying. We have to be humble before God and before the scriptures. Spanking is his idea. It's his idea, not, not the world's idea. So that kind of answers your questions. Timeouts, I mean, for us, we don't do them because we find them to be a, a massive waste of time and not very fruitful. <laughs> yeah. So in Hebrews... 11 or 12, we've, we've read this already a couple times, but it says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. What happens if during, during discipline, I spank my child and they're like smiling, they come out, they're just, you know, laughing, didn't ever cry. Um, what, what's going on there? I have a really great example of that. I think one of the last times uh, I spanked, uh, one of our sons, um, we would go into the the laundry room was right off the living room, and so I'd be like, "Hey, like that you you didn't obey, go in the laundry room." And I spanked him, and he like came out, and some of the kids, the other kids were in the room, and he's like, "That was a doozy," <laughs> and, like and winked. And Josh was just like, "Yeah, I don't think that that was." disciplining him or doing anything for him. Maybe we should <laughs> switch how we do things. So, yeah. That was the last time I ever spanked him. Yeah, that, that was a good example of, I think, reaching an age where we have to use some other means. And there is an age where you start to switch to, to, to different things because they're getting to an age where that's just not going to work because um, of the size of the kid and, and such. But um, I think oftentimes... Uh, when a parent will tell me I tried spanking, it didn't work, uh, oftentimes m my first question is, do they cry when you spank them? And oftentimes uh, I'll, I'll watch it sometimes when I'm at someone's house and they'll spank their kid and the kid just looks at them or the kid screams at them or the kid uh, just kind of laughs. <laughs> um, that's not biblical discipline. The Bible says, Kurt just read it, discipline is painful. If it doesn't hurt them, we need to do something that hurts them. So that means we might need to spank them harder. And uh, sometimes that we can get afraid of that. And we're not in any way advocating like an out-of-control uh, issue between you and the kid abusing your kid. But we are unapologetically advocating discipline to be painful. It has to be painful you shouldn't be freaked out that your kids are crying. They should cry. And here's one of the reasons why that's important. Um, not being disciplined is way more painful than a spanking. Getting hit by a car and dying and having to do your kid's funeral is way more difficult than them crying because they got spanked. Okay? But the reason we spank them is so then when we say, do not go into the street, that they respect our authority and obey so that they don't get hit by a car. And uh, when you see it, when I see, I've seen my kids disobey me when I say do not go into the street, I am struck by how important it is for discipline to be painful so that they don't have to receive a worse pain. And it's, it might not be a car hitting them. It could be when they're 30 years old and they're throwing tantrums in their workplace as an adult and they get fired or nobody likes them or they can't have success in life because... They're acting like a child when they're 30 because I didn't make discipline painful when they were a kid. That's true biblical discipline. So if they're not, I often say, if they didn't cry, you didn't do it hard enough. Just plain and simple. They need, and some kids, 
it's crazy, some kids. Like, some kids are not even two feet tall, and you, spank, you think, wow, I really spanked them hard, and they just kind of look at you, or they start laughing. You're just like, is this kid even human? Is this kid possessed? Like, what, what's the deal? Every kid's different. Some kids, you look at them wrong, and they just are a mess. They just are just totally, you know, you could just say, I'm going to discipline you, and there's, they, they're just, they can't handle it, you know. So every kid's different, but you have to know that some kids need to be disciplined harder than others because it, it has to be painful. Just for sake of time, we have, we have about 10 minutes left in the segment. Um, the next questions that I ask, if we could just keep it to one or two responses, that would be great. But in a scenario where both parents are at home, who should be the one that's, that's carrying out the discipline? Yeah, I'll, no, no, sorry. Yeah, so um, God has appointed me, since God has appointed me as the leader of our home and also the leader in discipline, um, when we are both home and when I'm home um, around the kids, I ask that Monique push all discipline to me. So if something's going on in the other room, um, I want her to bring it to me explain to me what's going on and for, my, for me to take the lead on discipline. If I'm in the same room, I need to be jumping on it. The expectation is that I'm going to lead in that. Um, and I think that's something that is really helpful for Monique as well when I'm doing a good job leading in that and taking that responsibility on. Can I just throw one? Sorry. Uh, important caveat to that. In the context where a husband is re- or wife, husband and wife are receiving instruction in the word in a church setting. I believe that it's best for a wife to be doing the discipline in that case most of the time, maybe not all the time, because sometimes the dad just really needs to step in and lead in that sense. Why do I say that? Because, because the man is called to lead, the man is the one who needs to be equipped with the word so that he can pastor his wife and kids. And the way that a wife can help her husband as the helper is to discipline kids so that a husband can receive the word in order to pastor and lead their family. Yeah, that's good. Okay, what about when, when it's at home, dad's maybe at work, mom is at home with the kids, and something happens? Is it all right for, for mom to say, you know what, we're going to wait till dad gets home, and you're going to get the spanking then? Um, I think it would be really a disservice to if you just always said that, if you always said just wait for dad to get home because then you are just like, the kids know like I can just rule when mom's home. I can just do whatever I want. And so I think also being a helper is when he's not home, you do a good job. So when he does come home, you're not like, oh my gosh, take the kids. I can't handle this anymore. You're supposed to be doing that at home, helping, doing this together. It's not like you're the only one that can discipline. I just tell you when they're naughty. I think a wife should be doing that, should be taking care of disciplining. And when dad comes home, it can be like, hey, there's been times that um, actually probably when they're older, I'd be like, hey, I'm going to talk to you, but when dad gets home, you're going to talk to him. And I think something we really established, or Kurt has really told our kids, when you disobey mom, you're disobeying me. When you disobey me, you're disobeying God. And just really lining up that authority in our home that, that they know that I'm under the authority of Kurt, Kurt's under the authority of God, and that that's the way it runs in our home. So to disobey me would be a big deal. And I think you have to basically set that even, you know, in your home while he's not at home. So to go along with that, let me just give a little scenario. Uh, Let's say one of the parents, let's say mom is uh, telling child to do something, child doesn't listen. So she says, okay, you know what? Go in your bedroom, dad's gonna come in and discipline you. Dad goes in and is kind of like, you know what? I want to show mercy to the kid. I'm I'm merciful and decides not to spank the child. What what does that do? What what effect does that have on on authority between mom and dad? It basically teaches the kid to not respect mom's authority. 
when you do that. And so we have a rule that if mom or dad tell one of our kids something, they can't go to the other parent and ask them the same thing for a different answer. And because that's actually using manipulation to subvert one of mom and dad's authority. And so we, we back each other um, no matter what. And so even if we disagree, we're gonna do that one-on-one -on -one later. We're, we're, we're not gonna show our kids that it's okay to question mom's authority or dad's authority. We're gonna be in unity together in it. We're gonna discipline, and then we'll talk about it one-on-one -on -one later. Yeah, if I could just um, add something to that. So we've actually fallen into the pitfall a little bit um, with our older ones, um, where something will happen with Monique and him, and I'll go in and do like the Sherlock Holmes thing, you know, where I'm like trying to understand what was actually going on. And there have been a few times where I've done a really bad job of realizing like part of the way through that realistically, Monique probably should have handled the situation differently entirely. Um, and one of, the <laughs> one of the struggles there, right, is we don't wanna teach our kids that if they come up with the right argument and they just, you know, explain things in a certain way that they can more or less get mom in trouble. And so I've actually done a really bad job. There's been a few times where that's happened where, um, you know, through questioning, I'm like, oh, okay, well, why are you even in here getting disciplined right now? But I think it's really important um, that we have that conversation with mom and that we go in as a unit and that there's not any, exactly what you said, there's not any dad versus mom. And I've seen this happen sometimes with parents where they'll be arguing with one another in front of the kid about whether they think it should or shouldn't be disciplined. I don't think that's really helpful in, in most situations. And it's like, who's the one that convinces the other parent and all of that, like that kind of thing. There needs to be a unity there. And when we come to our kids with discipline, there needs to be unity and also the father needs to be thinking, I want my kids to respect my wife at all costs. That is a very high, highly valued thing in our home. And so I'm going to discipline, even when, sometimes when things are a little murky, if the result of that is my, is my kids understanding that this is my wife and they will obey her. You know, and so just a little specific example there. I know we don't have a ton of time to, to get into every aspect of disciplining, but I really want to hit these last two um, topics of, of consistency and boundaries. So real briefly, would one of you just go ahead and, and take a stab at, at the importance of consistency in disciplining? I think when um, we're inconsistent in disciplining, it's very confusing for our kids. Sometimes, oh, it's one way, and I you know, have to be on my toes, and sometimes it's not, and I can do whatever. And so as parents, we're going to be faulty in being consistent. We can aim at consistency all the time, but also realize when we have become inconsistent, it's OK to rally the troops and say, hey, We've had times we've sat down with our kids and said, hey, we've been inconsistent. We're sorry, would you forgive us? We've actually sinned against you in our inconsistency, but now we're gonna be consistent. And I've heard it called different things. <laughs> you know, we, we call it boot camp at our house <laughs> when we, we've let things go and we've, we let the kids know we're gonna, we're gonna rally up and be more consistent now. And we tell them we're, that's unloving to you and we're sorry. So it's, it's really confusing, and um, it takes much longer to bear fruit when we're inconsistent. Yeah, I'm just going to read a verse on that. I read this the other day, and I thought it was so cool. This is God speaking his covenant to David. It says, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. My steadfast love will not depart from him. I just, I love that for just, like, consistency, you know? It's just like, oh, that's so good. That's, you know, God's covenant to David, but that just, again, speaks of God being consistent with us, even in discipline. Yeah, I know for me as a, as a dad, one of the things that I've thought about a lot throughout the years is, is just being um, maybe foundational for why I want to be consistent is out of Galatians 6, where it says, and let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap 
if we do not give up. And I know there's, there's times, you know, as parents, you're going to do a better job, you're going to do a worse job, like Mindy was saying, and um, there's, there's times where all of a sudden Angie and I would realize, oh my goodness, things have gotten out of control, we've been lax, we haven't really been consistent, and then we're like, okay, we need to step it up, we need to, to jump back into it, and sometimes, sometimes it might even, honestly, with a toddler, it might even take a week, two weeks before before you start seeing that fruit again, but you will see fruit. I promise you that. It's, it's a promise in the word, right? We will see fruit if we do not give up. Um, let's look at boundaries real quick. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard different people say, you know, why, why bother setting so many boundaries if, you know, less boundaries, less discipline, right? What, what are your guys' thoughts on, on setting boundaries and, and why, why would you set boundaries in your house and, and other people's houses? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, some boundary setting is really straightforward when it's a, a sin issue, you know, like talking back to mom or dad, right? That's disrespect, honoring your parents. It's an issue of sin. And so those boundaries, I think, are probably generally universally agreed upon. Um, but I think what can be really tricky is the boundaries that aren't necessarily sin. And um, as a parent, one of the things that uh, one of the things that Monique and I do constantly is we're always strategizing and we're trying to think about producing fruit in our children. So, if we want our children to uh, do a better job at a small group gathering, for instance, then we might have certain boundaries set in place at home that will produce that fruit. So there's a strategy there, and I know some people. So you can explain that to them, and some people are like, well, why are you disciplining your kid for that? That's not really like a sin issue, and that's something that Monique and I decide. But as believers, and I think, I think we all need a healthy dose of this, of recognizing that we can strategize. The Holy Spirit wants to help give us discernment and insight to strategize boundaries to put in place that aren't black and white sin issues in order to produce fruit in areas and help us val- help our children be able to let mom and dad uh, do the things that we think God is calling us to, you know, and that requires strategy, and it's not going to be exactly the same for every family, but one one of the things I think is crucial here is that when you put yourself around people who are doing a really good job with this, and you're seeing fruit in their children, to ask them, how did you produce that fruit? What kind of boundaries did you guys put in place that you felt like really helped in these scenarios and that's one of the best ways that Monique and I have received these um, sort of not black and white boundaries over the years to now we, we recognize how important and how valuable they are um, for raising our children. One other statement on boundaries. Uh, a non-sin issue like don't jump on the couch or don't hang on the blinds. A non-sin issue becomes a sin issue when a parent says, don't do that, and they disobey. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts on boundaries before we open it up for I'll questions? One, yeah. I'll say one thing. I think boundaries, um, like you're talking about when we're in gatherings with other people or even just functioning as a family, it's, it's teaching our kids to be considerate of one another. Mm-hmm. You know, So obviously there's different boundaries for different people, but it is really training them up to be loving Mm -hmm. and where it could be, we can function as a group and spend time together and it's enjoyable Mm -hmm. rather than sitting there thinking, oh, this is becoming a wreck or whatever, Mm -hmm. yeah. And I I think that like any kid who is brought up with boundaries in their life are more pleasant kids to be around. And it's not that we're just looking for ease and comfort for ourselves, but it's just, it's like you said, People who live within boundaries are more considerate, more kind, more loving, and uh, that's a loving thing for our kids to honestly be people that people want to be around. All right, we're going to open it up for you all to ask questions. If you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll come over with the microphone. Yeah, just a question more on the 
how or what width do you discipline? Is it with your hands? Do you use a rod, um, spanking spoon, like that? And then are there any things in the consistency of the way you discipline? Like is there a routine to that moment of actually disciplining that you find effective? Yeah, so this is the way that we found is effective. And I think it's important that you're in unity as parents on the method and how you discipline. It's also important that you approach it um, with consistency and with instruction and love and pointing them to the Lord. So what we do when they're younger is we, we take them to a room, which is our bedroom with a chair, and we have a spanking spoon. We have two spanking spoons that we found that are effective that um, inflict pain but don't leave marks. And so we, we spank them on the bottom and we hug them afterwards. We tell them, this is why you got a spanking. And they know it beforehand. We tell them a spanking for this. We tell them afterwards. We instruct them. And we tell them, I love you. I'm doing this because I want you to obey me and obey the Lord. And then we tell them, you're forgiven. And I found over time that if I use my hand, and sometimes you just don't have the spoon with you, it doesn't inflict enough pain for them to actually it be effective. It's kind of weird if you spank your child and they're kind of like, that didn't hurt. It's, there has to be pain because there has to be a consequence. And I've, I've also found before this, we were talking about the other day, that there's a time where I, I had a spank, I didn't have a spoon with me, and I used my hand, and it actually hurt my hand. You know, it, and I was like, well, that, that's ineffective, and I actually hurt my hand. So we found you actually have to have an instrument in order to be effective. And if other people can do it with their hand and it not hurt their hand and, it, and it's effective, that's great, but I can't. Yeah, I was just going to say to that, I've heard um, this before where people said, um, I don't want to use my hands because I don't want them to associate my hands with pain. Um, I find that to be a little bit strange to go in that deep with the thought process because if you're loving your kids through discipline and your, your kid is receiving your discipline as love, like if we're pointing them to the Father, if, we're, you know, if they're older, we're really preaching the gospel, we're talking about how it's an issue between them and God, using, they're not going to get confused about whether dad loves you or not, or whether mom loves you or not, with you use your hands. Like, well, I think he loves me, but he used his hands. So, you know, it's like, I, there's not really a confusion there. So I don't know exactly where that thought process has come from, but um, I think, I agree with Sean 100%. Like, we use a spoon because it's just, honestly, a lot more effective, and it doesn't require, like, the full baseball ball swing with the hips and stuff that a hand requires. Um, so it's, it's more the moment arm, you know, it's all about leverage. Stuart can tell you about that. But um, so we use a spoon and it, it's, it's uh, just a lot more effective. And our, we, I try to make it hurt. I'm not as concerned about the mark, the mark thing. Usually our kids have lots of, uh, or when they're younger, tend to have marks on their butt. And um, sometimes that just happens, especially Jaden will tell you a wonderful story of a chicken pot pie story. It was a refining moment for him. I don't know what the spank count was, but it was, it was high. The, man, the, the, the young kid did not want to eat chicken pot pie. It was, many marks were left. Um, but yeah, I also agree with Sean that we, you know, the, the, the back end of the discipline is as important in my mind, especially as they get older, as, as the front end. And something Monique has actually been challenging me on recently is I've been disciplining Lucia quite a bit and uh, kind of in the middle of doing other things. So I'll go over and discipline her. She'll throw her food on the floor, and then I'll just, like, go back to what I was doing. And even though she's not yet at an age where I'm going to explain, I'm not going to sit there and explain anything. I'm just going to say, don't throw your food on the floor, you know, and uh, give her a spanking. There, I do think it is important. She's reminded me to make sure that I'm taking time to, like, show her that I love her after that. And that's something that I've kind of just in my you know, doing my own thing, have just slipped out of that habit a little bit, that she was reminding me that it's good to do that. So I think the, the, the back end, making sure that we're taking the time to love our kid, to talk them through things, especially if they're older, is really important. And being consistent at home and discipline and stuff like that, um, is that something that when you take your kids over to like their grandparents' house, grandparents are known to spoil? Uh, 
is discipline something that grandparents can should or can be invited into, or should everything be handled at home and hopefully the fruit bears when they're at their grandparents' house, if that makes sense. So what Mindy and I have decided is that discipline is for mom and dad, for the kids, because I'm responsible for my kids. I'm responsible for instructing them. And um, in order for there to be consistency with the discipline and instruction, it's for us. So if they're naughty, and we're not really in that situation because we don't have biological family that lives in the state, but if they're naughty around, they used to though, uh, grandpa or grandma, back when we lived in Colorado, we, we would tell them, let us know when we get home, and then we would discipline them at that time. Yeah, I think with that question, it's also important to remember that <clears throat> discipline is not only spanking. So un unless you have grandparents with Alzheimer's or grandparents who are decidedly abusive, uh, there is a level of discipline that should be afforded them, right? If, if you leave your kids with them, they should be allowed to tell your kids, don't throw your soup on the floor. Mm -hmm. That's also discipline. So there are different levels of discipline as well. How you decide uh, the final stage kind of a punitive uh, spanking, whether or not grandparents are involved in that, that's, that's a different question. Uh, but I think both are, are very important to think through. So uh, probably one of the biggest challenges I think Josiah and I have faced um, in parenting is how to teach our kids appropriate emotional control and emotional responses. And um, I know we've sought advice from like a lot of you guys up here. Every week I'm like boxing someone like, help me. Um, but something that we do is for direct defiance, we do spank our kids. But then we realized that wasn't enough. We were telling them what to put off, but we weren't teaching them what to put on. And so we started um, trying to teach our kids emotional control by having them practice physical control. So after they would be spanked for being emotionally out of control, throwing tantrums, we'd have them sit quietly cross-legged with their hands in their laps for an extended period of time or whatever time we thought was appropriate. And I would just love to know if you guys have any advice on how to teach our kids um, how to have healthy emotional expression and boundaries even at young ages. I think that's a really good question because, you know, um, you know, whether it's a kid disobeys and gets spanked and they're crying or even a kid gets hurt, you know, they fall down and get hurt. Um, I think it's a really good idea for a parent to be uh, compassionate, you know, I mean, if they're in pain, you know, it's not wrong to be in pain, so you comfort a child. But then I think that there is, and, you know, different people might have different thoughts on, you know, what's, what's carrying on. And hopefully as a parent, you're seeking wisdom and you're actually really loving your kid. But I think that there's a lot of times, I think my dad and mom did a really good job of this, actually. I'm really grateful um, we uh, would get spanked and we would cry and my dad was fine with that be and my mom was as well because it would be painful but then there was a, a carrying on there was a it, you know and I even remember actually when I was younger being spanked and just like you know yes maybe some pain but then there was a, like a, I'm, a ang I'm angry I'm again there was a sign of defiance there um, and I actually can remember that um, and so if we would carry on, my dad would spank us again. And I don't think that that was unloving at all. I'm really grateful because basically it's, it's a loving thing when parents teach their kids, actually, you can, uh, you can deny yourself. <laughs> there, there, that is possible. That is a possible thing to do. And now I understand that it might not be possible for someone who doesn't have the spirit of God but that was still a good thing for them to teach us that, like, this, this is possible if you have Jesus. And it was a way of them preaching the gospel to us, actually, which I was so grateful for. And um, so another thing, though, I think in that, I, I don't know if you were just talking about after spanking, but even when our kids would get hurt, a lot of times 
sometimes kids get hurt and you see like the most resilient kids, they'll just hop up and keep playing. And then there's the kids that like their whole world crashes in. They have a major meltdown because they like literally had a bump. And I think that it's a really good thing to teach kids that um, hardship and pain and discomfort isn't bad. <laughs> that's, that's so anti-American culture, but I think it's really good for us to teach our kids that. There's a lot of kids that will carry on about their ailments and go on and on and on. I think, again, we should show compassion to our kids. I mean, when our kids get hurt, I sh hug them. I'm so sorry. I'll even pray for them. But then there's a time where I say, hey, we're not talking about this anymore. I want you to stop crying. And again, that might come off not compassionate, but I think it's really compassion. I think it's really loving to actually say to the kids, like, we're not going to focus so much on self. And so I think there's so many little lessons in that, that, you know, I, I watch different parents do different things. You know, there's like... Um, the breathing, the whatever, the whatever. I think a, a mere, um, hey, I'm so sorry you're hurt, but you know what? You're going to be okay. I want you to stop crying. And then after that, it's just a disobedience issue then. <laughs> and then it should be disciplined if, there, if there's disobedience. I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on processing with your kids why you're disciplining them without it becoming this. I'd read a book where it was like, every time you spank your kids, you're saying, I'm spanking you because God says so. I'm spanking you because God says so. How do you communicate well with your kids to where it's not this association of like spanking equals, you know, how God feels about me or just this like really negative association as they're, you know, from a young age, like two to five, like how do you process that well with your kids? I think that's a good question. So definitely very age dependent. Um, I think this was talked about earlier a bit. Um, I think Josh maybe touched on this a little bit, but some of it is, is when we fall into the trap of needing our kids to understand every decision we make, that is where it starts to get, uh, I think, pretty murky and starts to get a little odd and can actually produce um, bad fruit in our kids when they start disagreeing with us, right? They don't they don't see it the same way we see it. So you'll notice that when a kid gets older, that'll that'll grow more and more and more if you do a bad job with that, where they need to understand why mom and dad are disciplining. And so I think for especially on the younger end, I think you said two to five, but on the younger end of that, they're they're not necessarily going to understand. And one of the things that is important for Monique and I is we just want them to know authority. That's our goal is to know authority. And I think sometimes, you know, there can be some explanation there, especially as you get closer to the five-year-old age. But even at that, you know, it still can be quite a pitfall to try to um, feel the need to explain all the ins and outs of why they're being disciplined. You know, I think it's a very simple, it can be left to be a very simple issue of authority. Like dad said, you're not supposed to do this and you did it. You know, that simple. So that's part of the answer. There may be more as well. Uh, we don't tell our kids. We don't tell our kids when they're young that we're doing this because God told us to. We don't feel like we need to explain everything that God tells us to do. We just do it and trust that God's ways will show forth in the end by obedience. It goes along with what uh, Josh was just saying. Uh, especially at a young age, I think... By and large, the younger parenting generation right now errs on talking to their young kids way too much. Uh, I see it so often where I'm just thinking, th take the long view. They, they will get it. They will understand God's love. They will understand that it's from God if you stay consistent throughout their whole time. Um, but they don't need you to talk to them about it. Number one, they might not understand. Number two, uh, they will understand. And, I, I mean, I've had this conversation with my 18-year-old son. Hey, listen, I understand you don't agree. I understand you don't understand. But you also have to understand that I'm your dad. <laughs> and so I'm just asking you to do this. And even though you don't understand, and even though we've talked about it now for 45 minutes, uh, you're just going to have to do it. And can you just trust that I'm God's delegated authority? In that context, it's a little different because he's 18 years old, right? 
But even then, sometimes it has to come down to, we're not going to come to a place of agreement here. And uh, so those are kind of two things on that. Yeah, one more <clears throat> point on that. I think we should draw confidence from what the Bible teaches about the nature of man in the way that we discipline our children. And what I mean by that is uh, twofold. <clears throat> Number one, our children are created in the image of God, which means they're created knit together in their mother's womb very preciously, very sacredly. But what that also means is that there's a certain sense in which, according to Romans 1 and Romans 2, uh, as they grow, they actually know God even if they're not regenerate. They know that he exists based on creation. They are guilty before God for idolatry, for suppressing God's glory and, and exchanging his glory for things that they prefer above him. So sometimes we are so afraid about disciplining our children because we think if they don't understand the pain of discipline, they're going to cast a shade on the character of God. The Bible doesn't ever speak like that about children or, or about human beings. The Bible actually presents human beings as having been fearfully and wonderfully made and magnificent creatures made in the image of God who have all transgressed against his law and, and from whose hearts flow wicked things. And, and that's the root of the problem. So we should trust then that when we discipline, even if the kids don't perfectly understand why uh, the discipline has to take place the way that it does, namely with spanking, what they should understand is that they've done something that displeases their parents. They've done something that is a disobedience. And the pain of discipline and the, the remaining presence of mom and dad after the discipline, like we're not disciplining you because we despise you. We're not spanking you and then leaving you. We're spanking you and we're still here looking you in the face, loving you. That, that uh, demonstration that's given by the consistent disciplining of a, a father and mother with their children is itself a re-clarifying for fallen little ones of the very nature of God. And is a blessing, is something that is spoken of throughout the Proverbs as uh, uh, a an act of obedience on the part of the parents that will yield fruit and joy in the lives of the children. So uh, it's sort of like when you preach the gospel to unbelievers, you can be so timid and afraid of offending them that you never actually preach the gospel to them because you almost think that you're the Lord of their salvation, like you're the one that's going to save them by some perfect presentation with a perfect demeanor and your hair's in place and, and there's nothing here that could offend them. The fact of the matter is when the rubber hits the road, when they hear the gospel, they're going to be offended. And the fact of the matter is if we're going to discipline our children well, they're going to hurt for a while over it. But it will yield fruit if it's done in the fear of God and the love of God and uh, with care for their souls. So, One more thing to add. Um, I think it's important as parents to remember that uh, we have the Holy Spirit. God is with us. We're not alone in disciplining. And sometimes when you, if you get frustrated, sometimes you can forget that. But remember, like, you have a father that's with you. And also um, to remember that preaching the gospel to our children doesn't only happen when we're disciplining them. It happens through all of life. Yes. There's other opportunities. There are sometimes when I've been disciplining our kids, where you can see, like, if you're open to the Spirit, sometimes you can see, like, they're repenting right now, and they're feeling like I, I sinned against God, and sometimes those are good opportunities to preach the gospel and to help them recount, like, yes, you did, you sinned against God, but he's a good God, and he's faithful, and, just, you know, like, you go and you preach the gospel to them, sometimes that opportunity doesn't come and we're still faithful to discipline and we don't explain all of it. Just, But just to remember that be open to the Holy Spirit and you have um, God, you're doing this, you're not alone. Uh, what Monique shared brought this up as well to kind of balance even what I said just before. Um, there is a way in which you can kind of discipline in this Mad Max rogue way 
where, where you're actually not being sensitive to other aspects of what scripture says regarding discipline, namely, um, do not exasperate your children. Be sensible in your discipline. You should be sane. You should be at peace. You should be grounded in the way that you discipline them. So if they're at an age where you're speaking more to them, you shouldn't be speaking to them as though you despise them. You shouldn't be speaking to them as though uh, your disappointment in their actions means a disappointment in them. And so you have to be very cautious about that. You can go into some 45-minute lecture uh, with your son because the corner of his bed was not was not laid over when he made his bed that morning, you know, and now he's late to work and, and uh, whatever else, and, and you're exasperating him. You're not even being a good citizen, much less a Christian parent who's wise, when you're disrespecting them in the way that you discipline. D discipline of children is never disrespect or despising uh, of them. It, it is always something that is painful, that is God-centered, and that should should uh, push them toward Christ. And, and so uh, we should be able to say, even while we're disciplining our sons, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing it. I want him to flourish. And if this foolishness remains in him, it will be destructive down the road for him. So, so we've got um, a two-year-old who at times takes on the attitude of, I would rather die than eat that piece of egg that you're trying to feed me. Um, and we can spank him, and he cries and just gets more and more upset and frustrated. And wh where's the balance between, like, um, you know, spanking? Is there a point where it's like, this is not productive anymore? Are you exasperating? Where, where do you go with that? So uh, make sure I'm understanding correctly. Your two-year-old doesn't want to eat something, and you want him to eat, and you want him to know how, how do we handle that. Um, we had that very recently in our home, where our two-year-old, he, he didn't want to eat something, and it, it was rebellion. I could tell that it was rebellion. And as parents, you know your, your kid's heart when they're rebelling against you, when you tell them, take a bite of that, and they're looking at you like, no, I'm not going to do that. So I spanked him. I told him to take a bite of that. Uh, he didn't, so I picked him up and I spanked him again and he took a bite of it and he was fine and after that no problems and so it, it, it's one of those things where you know when your kid is being rebellious it's an authority issue it's it's not necessarily a, a circumstance issue it's an authority issue and as parents um, it's our job to teach our kids that they're under our authority that they they need to obey us um, there's been other times where I can tell it's not a rebellious thing, and my kid was eating, and they just didn't like something, and as long as they take one bite of it, I tell them, just take one bite, and they'll take one bite of it. You don't have to eat the whole thing. That's fine. But you know when your kid's heart is opposed to what you're telling them to do, and it comes out really strongly at that age, at two. Um, that's when they're, they're starting to really be able to be more mobile, able to move and eat and feed themselves and all those things. And so that, that's how we handle it. It's like, no, you need, you need to actually submit to mom and dad's authority on this. Uh, I'll add that to that. Gina and I have had some really stubborn kids. No idea where they got it from. Uh, but especially in the area of eating, we had one kid in particular that would not eat. And so much so that no matter what, it wouldn't eat. And the next morning, she would wake up with her dinner in her mouth. She'd fall asleep and still have it in her mouth the next day. Because uh, she refused, refused to eat it and swallow it. I mean, so stubborn. And we're talking same age, two years old, right? Yeah. So here's, the, here's one thing we learned from that. Uh, take the long view, okay? Sometimes, uh, like in those instances, we lost the battle, so to speak. <laughs> like, they, she did not, she would not bend her will. And we, we were very much like, oh, you're not going to win this. We are God's delegated authority. You're not going to win. Um, but I think looking back now, and that was one of our earlier kids, I think it would have been good for us to take more of a long-term approach and realize some things take longer than a night to get through to our kids or a week or a month or a year or years or 18 years even. Like some things take a long time 
And you have to realize, I'm not, their, I'm not babysitting my kids for a night. I'm their parent. I'm going to be parenting them for the rest of their life. And so sometimes, and we would do this with some of our other kids, sometimes you, you're battling, you're battling, and it's just like, you know what? We're not going to keep doing this. We'll have other times to teach this aspect and uh, uh, confront their rebellion and defiance and stubbornness. But th- this, is, this is kind of enough here. Maybe we'll, just put them, maybe we'll just take away something else from them or we'll put them to bed. Okay, you're not going to eat, then you're going to go to bed. Or we'll just realize, you know what? We're going to have other opportunities. We're not going to get lax on this. We're not going to use it as an excuse. We're going to keep on this. But we're not going to get this into our kid in one night. It may take longer. And depending on the kid, I mean, I shouldn't be shocked by it, especially knowing my kid's parents. But some of my kids were extremely stubborn, extremely stubborn. And it almost shocked me on how defiant they were. Um, but I, I kind of, Gene and I wish we would have taken, with, with our earlier kids, would have taken more of a long-term approach and not been so crazy anal when they were younger. You just realized, you know what? We're going to have opportunities to take care of this. And she eats now, right, Sam? Like, she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't keep food in her mouth anymore. So, it, like, it, it eventually got through. Maybe to piggyback um, off the last question and offer maybe some clarity, I don't know. Um, Yeah, so let me give an example from our son, Scout. Uh, And this kind of goes on off of also what Lacey was saying with emotional, um, being able to control emotions. So again, we'll use the example of food. Uh, Scout doesn't want to eat his food, we spank him. Scout doesn't want to eat his food, we spank him again and tell him, hey, we've told you to eat your food. And then the more spanks he gets, you know, depending on the day, if he's just feeling extra spicy that day, he might throw such a fit and continue to throw such a fit that he literally cries himself into throwing up his food. And then it's like, okay, so who won that? Like, we all lost in that instance, and you kind of actually won. So, like, at what point do you say, this is not worth it because of your emotional state? And at what point do you say, actually, no, we need, we need to establish boundaries and control? Yep. Uh, in Ephesians, it says, do not exasperate your children. I know we've talked about that already. And we found there, there are certain points where it, it's just not fruitful when our kid is in that position where they're, they're just emotionally so worked up that they're, they're going to throw up, right? That, that's actually unloving to try to spank them and instruct them at that point. So what we do in that situation is, is we, we put them in the room and we wait for them to calm down. And then, and then we, when they're able to actually get a spanking and have settled down and they're, no, they're not, no longer at the point of where they might just be throwing up because they're just so worked up, We'll give them a spanking and discipline them at that point. But it, like I agree with what Josh says, it's a long-term heart approach. You're, you're, you're not going to solve it in one thing. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to cater to your kids. You want them to learn that mom and dad are an authority. And they, they have to submit to that authority and be consistent in that. Um, but you also don't want to sit there and, and just provoke them to be exasperated when they're just so emotionally not able to handle it at that point. Uh, the same thing happened with our kids. We, we had that happen multiple times. It's, it's incredibly demoralizing as a parent. Uh, so I can relate to you. You're not alone. Just want you to know that. No, really, you're not alone, Josiah. It's okay. <laughs> um, I will say this, though. Uh, exactly what Sean said is right on. One other thing to add to that. As a general rule, I always say this to parents, and I say it in my own home. It's never okay to throw a tantrum. Ever. Never. There is no justifiable reason for a tantrum to be okay. It's always manipulation or rebellion or defiance or selfish. It's, it's sinful. And so sometimes the reason our kids are puking when we're telling them not to eat their food and they're so upset is because we're not being consistent teaching them that tantrums aren't okay in other scenarios where they're not eating food. And I don't know if that's the case with you and Scout, but it might be. And it's good to make sure that you're being consistent to teach your kids that it's never okay to throw a tantrum. 
And it's also not okay to throw a tantrum if you tell them to just go do it in another room. Because then you're teaching your kids that as long as your sin doesn't harm someone else, it's okay. And that's why people justify homosexuality. And that's a bad thing to teach our kids. It's important to remember that actually discipline instruction, it occurs continually. And not even in the moment of when they need a, a spanking, right? It, 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 it needs to be done out of the context of relationship. And so that is the times that we found is actually the most fruitful in instructing our kids is when we're enjoying spending time together, when we don't have to do anything as consequential, but we're able to teach them, okay, this, this is what God's word says. This is, this is why we are obedient to God. This is why you obey mom and dad. When you're, when you're hanging out, when you're fishing, when you're, you're doing activities that you enjoy doing together. And so that, that's a consistent that will bear fruit is if you're doing it out of the context of enjoying relationship with your child. Then in addition to those moments where you, you, you need to actually give them a spanking and instruct them as well. We are a little bit over time, so we'll just take one last question just to keep the schedule. Yeah, I have a one-line comment tagging onto that Go ahead. quick while you're walking up the aisle. Uh, one good way not to give in to your children when they're throwing a tantrum is to be sure that you don't throw tantrums, uh, adult tantrums. Sometimes your child can be throwing a tantrum and then you throw a tantrum in response, you know, like, why are you doing this? I can't believe you're doing this. That's, that's an adult tantrum. Uh, and what you're actually doing is being led by them when you do that. It's like, hey, I'm going to start this really crappy party by throwing a tantrum. And then dad says, hey, I'm going to join you. Let's do it together. Let's double the horribleness of this experience. No, rather we should discipline them and we should be thinking about the gospel, not being ashamed when our kids sin because they sin for the same reason we do. The answer for them is the same answer uh, for us, Christ, the gospel, his word, his grace. And uh, we can let our hearts be stilled even when our children are sinning discipline them with level heads and that that will also help to diffuse patterns of tantrum throwing that that might have become customary for them um my question is pretty practical <clears throat> but um when you have a child that uh is not like gina you were saying at an age where you're ready to move on to s something else or maybe pass on the uh, discipline completely to the father, but the father is away and you have a very strong kid. I mean, I'm not talking about like stubborn strong, I'm talking about like physically strong. And uh, how do you, I mean, do I, in those, in those circumstances, do I wait for dad in every, every time or, I'm just talking about a really strong, physically strong kid that is a little difficult for mom to discipline. <laughs> yeah, I think um, since I know what that feels like, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think something you have to establish is when they're fighting you, uh, that's actually disobedience. And there's a training as like, I have kids like, hey, you have to get a spanking and I mean, it's hard to hold them down. And we're like, you can't have that. I'm not wrestling the kid to spank him. I'm just not going to do that every time. So, like, hey, you need to come here. You need to lean over. I'm going to give you a spanking. And if they're not even obeying that, they're going to get a discipline for that. And as I think it's, again, it's one of those things, like, I think it's been said, this is not something that you just are like, oh, I'm going to do this this one time, and then they're just going to walk up and they're going to lay over it's not going to happen. Sometimes it's going to take a while. And they're going to be like, hey, we're going to do this again. You need to come in. You need to obey me. I mean, I've had kids that, like, I'm going to the room, and they're holding the door frame. And I'm like, no, 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 let, let go of the door. We're going, we're getting the spanking. And it's just that they're refusing because they know what is going to happen. But also, I think you just have to be like, okay, you can't do that. You're going to get a spanking if you do that. And just continue and believing that as I continue to train, there is promises of this, and I have seen fruit. I have had kids that have struggled, struggled, and then after a while, they have walked in, you know, and, and they have been compliant because I think they know that I'm doing this out of love 
And I think it's something that it's, it's disobedient when they're struggling. Yeah, and just to jump onto that. So that's where I think we have found, especially when they're younger, consistency in the discipline process. I mean, consistency with discipline altogether, but even in the process can help that. It's not necessarily a one thing for everyone. Not, you know, you don't have to do it the same way, but one of the things that we did is, you know, we would typically go into our master bathroom and like, if there's any defiance when I ask them to sit down on the toilet or ask them to put their hands on the counter, like if I'm gonna spank them, they get spanked for that before we even get to the actual issue. And then after the spanking even, if they, uh, start looking like they're manifesting a demon by the way that they're acting or like jumping around and doing all that without explaining anything I spank them again and then I say you're not to be you cannot throw a fit because you didn't like that you know and honestly that was very fruitful yeah. with with our children yep. and then uh, for any of you parents with with really strong uh, children Sean actually agreed to uh, demonstrate how to do spankings. So a little bit, little bit after this, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there's a coffee area over there. I'll be happy to talk with you. There, there are some good holds. Um, you know, I was fortunate to have wrestled in high school, and so that's helpful. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pray to wrap it up, and then we will break for 15 minutes before coming back. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that you have um, disciplined us because you're a loving father, Lord. Teach us. Show us, show us what it means to be loving parents and, and, and how to discipline our children properly. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen.